Yeah, we're good. Right, happy days. James Huck, pleasure to meet you. You too, Hugh. Cheers, Great mate. to see you. Thanks and for having uh, me on. Also achieving the social distancing. Yeah, just about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, you were asking before about Forces Barbarians. Who are we going to play? Oh, this will lead in in a minute. Basically play play anyone. We, mm. So, the, the members come from all over the UK. Um, so, we try and have a game, basically Scotland, Wales, Scotland, England. That's for next year. Yeah. Uh, against just average sites. We don't train. Just rock up on the day, giving your kit. Play. It's like that. Yeah. It was literally like the barbarians. Huh? Y- yeah, you can't. Yeah, exactly. But you can't. We can't have training sessions. We're all, we're all over. I mean, some of our members are New Zealand, America. People who used to be HM forces, and they're all over. So we're like, we've got a we target an America tour next year. It's a proper. Yeah. It's mega. So, which leads me on to nicely. I I put out a question to the forces barbarians members earlier. Mm. I said, James, what's coming on? Anyone got any questions, right? Now, I apologise in advance. You know what rugby crowds are like, okay? So, some of these are serious. Some of these are just bollocks. <laughs> right, I'll go through these now. Uh, not asking that one. <laughs> How many of those you got? <laughs> right, here's the standard run, right? Johnny Ball. Not that Johnny Ball. Different Johnny Ball. He said, who's the England player you most wanted to be? This is this is, this is is the standard we're at, right? Yeah, it's a good start. Did- uh, I suppose Johnny Wilkinson, I suppose. Oh, certain so, Simon Piles there said he bet he says Johnny Wilkinson. He's only said. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's the first one that comes to mind, then he's. Why Johnny? I, well, I suppose a 10. Bring us in, Jeff. I suppose it's a 10. Um, someone I, I admired growing up. I used to love watching his DVDs. So, as a kid, so I, was, I, I always wanted to be a goal kicker. So, I used to watch uh, Johnny Wilkinson, The Perfect 10. Have you seen that DVD? I've heard of it, I've not seen it. Yeah, so I used to watch that all the time and. He was, he was obviously dedicated, going out practicing his kicking all the time, so I used, used to basically copy him. So when I had the chance to, to play against him, I was I was over the moon, like, you know, so yeah. I don't know. I suppose he's, he's the first one that comes to mind, so... Makes sense. You know, you, but he's not a bad on a beat, to be fair, is he? No, not, not bad at all. I mean, I suppose if you, if you had to be an England player, that's the thing, isn't it? You win <laughs> by choice. Right, got a few here. A guy called Tony Shannon, uh, ex-military, Irish, plays for Old Lems up there. Yeah. Uh, if you had to do it all again... And you had to be a forward, which position would you play and why? Oh, fucking no. I wouldn't be a front row, would I? Tell you what. Uh, probably a seven. Like a Justin Tiprick type of player. Yeah. yeah. On the outside of the scrum there, standing yeah, away from Yeah, stay, stay away from the front row. Put in the big hits. <laughs> get your hands on the go. Right, okay. Uh... Right, the laws of the game are changing to make it safer and safer. Understandably, the front row is always an issue, mm. but how far should the RFU go in making it safer, safer when it's a contact sport? Oh, they, they try it, don't they, with obviously the, the tackle area, trying to sort of bring the, the, the tackle height down all the time. But I don't know, it's tough. I think you look, but then you've got someone like Owen Farrell then with his tackle the other day. Uh, he gets, only gets a sort of four, five week ban. Do you know what I mean? So I don't know what sort of example I set then, really. But I know they are trying, they are trying to make the game safer. Um, but it, I don't know. It's, it's a contact sport. And like you, you, I'm thinking of players like, like Richard Hibbard, who I've played with most of my career. And he, he loves the physicality, and the reason he plays the game is because he enjoys the phys- physicality. So you've got to be careful about taking too much of that away as well. Like you know, There's nothing better than putting a big hit in, is there? No, well, I wouldn't know, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, on that, what it, what it seems to be causing an, causing an issue at the moment, one of the things that's causing an issue is how good the camera technology is. Mm. And when they, they watch, a, they'll replay a big hit or a tackle or like an accidental high tackle or something yeah. like that and they play it back but in slow time mm. and it's not the speed it was and it, no. I think it's it goes against the player when you can't think that fast when it, it, slow-mo th- makes it look like you've got more time than you actually have to yeah speed. definitely and like you know if, you, if you're making a tackle and it's, it's too high sometimes the the ball with the play with the ball is, is dipped you know but in slow-mo you, you, you don't really see that oh sorry in, in real time you don't really see that do you so and it's quite tough because you know it's a split second reaction from the tackler and it, it is tough sometimes, but I suppose, you know, the, the blade dump ones you've got to try and cut out, but some of the 50-50 ones, you know, are just sort of bad timing, I suppose, mm. sometimes. Yeah. Uh, I think, I don't know. Yeah, there's one more. One more. Kicking oriented again, from Tony Shannon. Kicking has always been for those players who have the dedication to practice <clears> and practice <throat> and practice. What tips would he give minis and juniors when they start out wanting to be a kicker? And did, and did you have any step changes in your kicking training and development? Yeah, that's a good question. Like I say, I, I watched all of Johnny Wilkinson DVDs, Neil Jenkins DVDs, and you mentioned just there, who it's, it's 
you got to, obviously it's a, it's a technique and you know you got to understand the technique but it, it's just practice and it's just executing that that technique you've got so you've got to settle on you know sort of how many steps you take back and meet to the side the way you want to place the ball so you get comfortable with the way you want want to kick and, and feel comfortable kicking and then it's just reps you know what I mean I'm also lucky enough to be in the Ospreys now as, as, a, as a kicking coach and especially the younger boys you know it's, you've got to go out there and do the work you know it's no good just having sort of five or six kicks at the end of a session and, and hoping you can turn up on the weekend and, and knock them over in front of big crowds like you know you've got to you've got to put that pressure on yourself and, and, and work hard and, and put the hours in and and if you want to become you know the Johnny Wilkerson Neil Jenkins you know or Lee Halfpenny bigger whoever it is then the, these boys are putting the hours in after everybody's gone home from from training and have all the other players in in their cars spinning away and and to be honest, that's why they, they do get paid, you know, probably a bit more money than everyone else because they probably put in more work in and, and getting the results on the weekend. On that, right, on the on that kicking under pressure side of things, obviously, you well known for your reliability with the kicking, especially under the, under the pressure. Um, how how do you <coughs> go about blocking that? I mean, especially in a big stadium, big mm. match. How do you go about mentally when you're there, you're lined up, the ball's on the tee, how do you go about preparing your mind for it? Is it a case of do you shut it out or do you bring it in and sort of accept it it's that, how do you shut out sort of 74,000 people like it's uh, you got to ask that you can't, you can't shut it out it's, it's there and that's, and that's that like, but going back to what I'm saying I think you take that confidence from the work you've put in the week or you know the, the last month and knowing that you've, you've put the work and then confidence in, in your ability and your technique to, to knock it over and you've got to try and draw yourself in a little bit and it's, it's just you the ball and the post you know there's, there's surroundings and the crowd around you and like I say, you can't block that out, but you've got to try and try and bring in a little bit, but just trust in your confidence and, and your technique throughout the week. Repetition. Yeah, it is. It is yeah. hard work. It's like most things, really, isn't it? But, yeah, it's just a little bit different because it's just you and the ball and the post, really, for, for that sort of 30, 45 seconds. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. Um, retired now, obviously, professional rugby, or retired from playing, I should say. Yeah. Looking back, right, how... From the perspective of uh, an employee, should we say, just not not of any particular club, just generally, <clears throat> how ruthless is it at top flight? Top flight rugby, how much? How challenging is it? What just from day to day, or just the, the game, or just day to day, uh, day to day? Obviously, the matches themselves, physically demanding, mm. mentally demanding. But outside of that, I mm. mean, that's I mean, the matches, eighty minutes or yeah. 85, 90 minutes of a day, right? Um, what about all the rest of it as a package, the whole thing? What, what was it like for you? Yeah, every, everything you do leading up to that game is revolved around around that game. So, you know, the build-up on a Monday, you know, you, you, so you're playing a Saturday. On a Monday, okay, you review the game from, from a Saturday. But, you know, whether it's a win or a loss, you, you haven't got too much time to, to reflect on that because there's a game the following week. So, you know, it, it's tough sometimes if you have a really good win, especially, you know, for Wales and the Six Nations or whatever, and you want to try and celebrate that. It, it's... You know, it's on to the next game. You've got six days, and there's another big game, so you can't focus too much on it. But on the positive side, if you have a bad loss, and you know we've got you know a game the next week, so it is tough. And I, I suppose that there's a lot of pressure that comes with it. You know, it's, it's obviously great, and never it wouldn't have changed anything about my career. But for for 15, 16 years, it's it's constant. You know, week after week, it's you know you sort of park park the game from the weekend and you're on to the next game. It's it's constant, and I think you. you as a player, you know, you're used to that sort of routine as well. And I suppose when you finish playing, like I have, like you say, I'm, I'm lucky enough to have gone into a, to a job, you know, as soon as I finish, which which I'm, I'm thrilled about. But it's that routine, usually on a Sunday, you're given your schedule for the week, you know exactly what you're doing on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, until the following Sunday. And I suppose when you finish, you, you don't have that anymore. It's probably the same with you, who, and with, with the army, you'd probably don't quite have the same sort of schedule as, as a rugby player. But when you come out of it, you it's, it's completely different. Even though I'm, I'm still in the environment of, of the rugby environment, I'm not a player. So even though I know a lot of the boys there now, I'm sort of, I, I'm sort of away from that side of it. You know, the changing room banter. I'm not involved in any of that. And I suppose that is the the toughest thing, coming away from it. Because I I'm done playing. I was I was happy. You know, I can I can watch a game now. And I don't think to myself. I wish I was out there playing because I'm done. You know, my body wasn't wasn't uh, willing to carry on really so I'm, I'm I'm comfortable with that but I suppose just getting used to the things you've been used to like the small things like you know I talk about Sean the kit man great bloke you know just turning up and just having a, having a coffee after training with him like stuff you take for granted which are there and when you finish it's it, it's all changes but like I say I'm lucky enough to be in the Ospreys with him and we can still have a coffee but it's just little things like that which perhaps 
people don't really understand sometimes. Mm. It's interesting, like you know, analogize it to the military side of things. I agree. It's, I think it's one of the, you know, it's, we'll come on to it again in a bit. It's, it's that change from what you know to the unknown. When I was in, and it's interesting, like your your perspective on this. When I was in, one of the things I would struggle with, and in hindsight, I would find uncomfortable, should we say. And again, I didn't know it at the time. Was I would go from work, like I don't know, go go on leave basically. Mm. So fear would be equivalent to be the end of the season. You know, I go, I go, I finish whatever I was doing, and then go on leave for two, one, two or three weeks, whatever it was. And I really wouldn't know what to do myself for the one, two or three weeks because the routine had been taken away. Mm. So it'd be, I'd be, I wouldn't have a clue what to do. And the national yeah. thing to think on the gone, gone, gone the piss. Yeah, and yeah, crazy yeah, stuff. yeah. You know, what, what about what's your experience <clears throat> like, like that? You know, you know gaps in the season and then the off season how did you was yeah what was that like for you well when I was playing or, yeah. or no when I finished no when you play um oh, to, to be honest it, it, it was nice I enjoyed it because I, I got, a, got a wife and, and three boys now and so they, they fill my time when I'm when I'm not or when I wasn't playing uh so in the weeks we'd have off uh you know well four or five weeks we'd have off at the end of the season we'd we'd go away on holiday and and try and just rest the body a bit, you know, and uh, obviously catch up with with friends and, and, and go out and have a few drinks because obviously, like I say, during the season, you you constantly you can't have a few drinks, obviously, after games, but, you know, you're constantly thinking about the next game. So it's just nice to switch off, complete switch off on rugby, not pick up a ball up until my boys ask me out in the garden to have a full full game of uh, game of rugby for two or three hours. But, uh, yeah, just try and switch off as much as you can and get away from it and, and not even really watch rugby and... You know, so when you do come back, you're sort of mentally fresh as well as physically. Not even watching rugby, complete step away from it. Um, no, nah, to be honest, if it's on in the background, I you know I'll, I'll have a look look at the score and stuff. And but no, nah, not really. You know, when I wasn't playing, now it's a bit different. Now I finish, you know, I'm enjoying watching a bit of rugby and doing a bit of analysis and things like that. But when I was playing, if if it wasn't anything to do with our game or the opposition we are playing against, yeah, you know, I, I want too fast to be honest. Mm. Mm. On the uh, for the clubs you played for, they must have all been pretty different the way they went about and did things. Were any of them particularly stand out in terms of the, that routine you talked about, the discipline you talked about, um, and also that, like the culture and the people you were with? Anyone stand out as being particularly challenging? You don't have to name names if you want it, <laughs> but it's just uh, yeah, oh, clubs. You mean ours in uh, yeah, clubs, club, well, yeah, yeah, I think. So I played, obviously played in the Ospreys uh, at two stints there. Then went to Gloucester and went to Perpignan and. Gloucester and, and the Ospreys were pretty similar in terms of the professionalism and you know the well drilled, the conditioning staff and everything were were, were really professional. Perpignan was was different, and I'm not saying it was good or bad, but it was it was different in terms of the professionalism. So when we got out there, so for example, if I was playing on a Welsh summer tour and my club was the Ospreys or Gloucester, you'd come back, you'd they'd look how many games you played or how, how many minutes you'd had in the tour. And then probably give you so so many you know so many weeks off and say right, you look to target this game when you come back, but in Perpignan I'd gone I think it was South Africa we went uh, yeah, I think it was a South Africa tour summer tour I went on came back straight into Perpignan didn't have any time off my my preseason training so you usually have three four weeks of intense preseason training my preseason training was literally uh, a lap the doctor came out he said do a lap on the pitch just to make sure I, I could run I felt good which I knew I could because I'd played a week ago. And he was like, right, you're fit to play in the pre-season game against Toulouse on Friday night. And it was like a two or three pre-season games and straight into the top 14 league. And, and to be honest, I didn't notice any difference. So the difference from having a, a full four, five-week pre-season to having nothing, I didn't really notice anything throughout the season. So I don't know. I don't know whether, whether it was a good thing or a bad thing, but it was just run differently. Like you know, It's, it's a little bit more different now because that was back in sort of 2011. So, you know, sort of nine years on now, but... It probably has changed a little bit, but it's still a little bit behind in France in terms of that professionalism. That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. That four or five weeks compared to nothing, no preparation, didn't make much of a difference. I mean, <clears throat> it is interesting because I think it says, again, you got, this is just sort of it's hard, hard to tell without seeing everything else that's going on, but it, it, seem, it seems to scream the value of rest. Hmm. You know, um, yeah, of rest in the body, rest in the mind, and how, how much capability that gives you. That is interesting, I didn't yeah. realise. didn't realise. Yeah, it's just how diff- two different clubs work, really. And like France, you know, P- uh, Clermont was a uh, when I was there, it was probably one of the more professional French clubs. And like I say, they're probably all sort of catching up a little bit now. But in terms of the conditioning and stuff, 
the Welsh and English clubs were way way ahead than than the French. Mm. When did you retire? Was it May? Yeah. So that, well, before before the lockdown, so I was open to finish. My contract finished in in May, so I was open to finish off with a couple of games. But uh, yeah, I got cut short, so my contract finished yeah, May this year. How has it been since leaving? You've obviously gone straight into a job. Yeah. It, it's a strange one because I think everyone doing the lockdown was temporarily retired, really, weren't they? Because they couldn't do anything. So it, obviously for that certain amount of time, I was just you know spending time with the family, going out with the kids like probably everyone else was, you know, going for their daily walks and things. And I knew by then I'd finished playing. Um, and I knew I was going to be going into to a job when it all sort of kicked off again with, with the Ospreys and, and with Swansea University. So... Yeah, I was quite, like I said just now, you know, I was comfortable in the fact I'd finished playing, that I wasn't going to play again. I, I Obviously, I suppose I have my testimonial match, will probably go on next summer. Um, but in terms of playing professionally, I was comfortable with that. And I think that's the biggest thing when speaking to players who retired, is just trying to get into that routine. And, and like we just spoke, we're not having that banter with the players and just getting into your sort of uh, a new job. And it's, it's a new life, essentially, isn't it? You know, and... Uh, I'm, I'm probably a little bit different because I'm still around the, the boys and that sort of sport and environment. But I can imagine, I can see how tough it probably is for some people who get cut short, get their careers cut short, you know, in their early 20s, mid-20s, where they're at the top of their game. And like I say, all they know is turning up the training, going through the training routine throughout the week, and then that's gone. And all of a sudden, you've got to go out and, and you, you, you're not on the same wages, you know. You're probably not on any wages for a bit because you probably haven't got a job. Um, some boys don't have insurance so obviously it's another killer blow and um, and if they haven't got anything to fall back on which is something to be fair the the Ospreys and the Welsh regions in particular now we've got a WRPA uh, representative which is the Welsh Players Association a guy called Tim in the Ospreys who's who is a bit he's a godsend he's he basically puts in place things for for every single player whether they're a high profile player young academy player there's finds out what their interests are, you know, what they're interested in doing, whether it's further education, an apprenticeship, carpentry course, whatever it is. So if something like that does happen, where their career's cut short or they finish a career on their terms, whatever it is, they've got something to fall back on because my first stint in the Ospreys, there was nothing like that, you know, you, you sort of, uh, yeah, you know, if that happened, you'd sort of fend for yourself type of thing, like, you know. That's that's brilliant. <clears throat> do, WRPA, and do, do most clubs have that now? Um, so it's the Welsh Players Association. So that that's I mean, for all of Wales. Most have someone like him in the club doing that. So yeah, there was one in every club. So Tim Tim Jones, ex police officer, great great bloke, and Sean knows him as well. He's uh, he's in the Ospreys, and then there's obviously another three then in, in Cardiff, Tlethley, and, and Newport. But the England have it as well. Um, but they don't have one individually for for each club. They have sort of one guy split around sort of three or four clubs. So. You, you wouldn't see him, or you'd see him perhaps once a month or once every two or three weeks. But Tim is there. He's there half a six in, in St. Helens now because we've moved there. Half a six every morning. He's probably one of the last to leave as well. And it's not just, you know, stuff for when you finish rugby. It's, it's anything. If you've got any any problems, he's, he's almost like a psychologist. He's, you know, a WRPA rep. He's, he's a guy that has, you know, been welcomed and, and needed, I think. That's, that is yeah. that is flipping awesome. What about um, what about like in your situation where you you know it's coming to it's not an abrupt end, <clears> but you know by choice it's coming to an end. Did he have any involvement with you? Like before, was it like a three months before, six months before, yeah. kind of prep to get out? Yeah, yeah, it was. And so obviously I'm doing in, into coaching now. So I I done my level three coaching qualification, which the, the Welsh Rugby Union have put a professional players uh, level three on for the for the professional boys which has started this just started this year so tim you know was the one that got the ball rolling there and got got me and a few of the other boys justin tiprick paul james bradley davis lee halfpenny there's a lot of boys on that course who just come to the end of the first year now and that's going to roll every year so he helped get me on that and but that, cause that's something the route i wanted to go down but like i say a, any young boys is like a, a sort of booklet you fill out basically which finds out exactly what your your interests are and what you know things you potentially could go and do when you finish playing because if you're lucky you know what Salomon Jones he's 35 now you know he's probably got a couple of years left probably maximum so it's 37 38 maximum you're done you know what I mean but you still got you know sort of two thirds of your life left with a bit of luck so you, you obviously got some got to have something to fall back on so he's the man there that's, that's sorting all that out and trying to make it as easy 
a transition for the boys as, as possible. So, yeah, like I say, he's, he's a godsend and had a top load to go with it. You, mm. You'd go on with him, who? <laughs> <laughs> Is that going to top load? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, that is interesting. I think because again, analogies that can be drawn here, is that when you're in a when you're in a bubble of something of something that's elite, uh, be that rugby rugby clubs, teams, or like my kind of background, mm. ex military background, when you're in that bubble, you you seem to be very short sighted because anything outside of that bubble is irrelevant. Yeah. Okay, if it's not if it's not towards the common goal of winning the game, winning the league, winning the cup, whatever it is, then it. It, it is, especially in the old school times, irrelevant yeah, to what you're yeah. doing now. Like, so family, nah, take a back seat. Yeah. You know, downtime, take a back seat. Injured, yeah, you're fucking, you're you're off the radar until you you're better, son. Yeah. Um, and what that means, and like as you pointed out, what that means is, in relative terms, the career in inverted commas is pretty short. Yeah. It's not like a 40, 50 year career of like traditional sort of corporate means. You've mm. got, to, like you said, you can have a whole other life after that. Mm. But, um. And uh, that's what I say. It's really good. Uh, Tim, Tim is there doing. I didn't realize that. It's really good. Yeah. It always makes me wish we had that. <clears throat> we got yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's something to think about, isn't it? I'll tell you, Army. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but uh, it, it is important. And I suppose, yeah, like the difference with, I suppose, the, the real world, as, as people call it, in, in the, the rugby sort of uh, world, is we sort of almost do it backwards to to other people where you earn, you know, good money at professional level of rugby, um, and then when you finish, you know that that all of a sudden just drops instantly. You know what I mean? It's not a, a gentle decline. It's like, you know, you're on decent money and then gone, it's gone. And you've got to work your way back up. But sort of, you know, sort of a normal job where there's, you know, accountant, a solicitor, whatever, you'll work your way up and you keep building, your wages will go up and hopefully you'll stay at, at a constant level. Pension. Pension, exactly. Mm. So and that, that's another difference, which you talk about the routine and the other things. It's, you know, it's a financial impact for, for a lot of players as well. So, you know, there's a lot of things to to sort of bear in mind really mm. I suppose it must make you quite uh, <clears throat> entrepreneurial minded I think generally because again it, is it is it almost like an unknown to you, you when did you get into professional rugby when, how young were you uh, 18 yeah you put, 18. Like, so you're like a kid yeah right so, is it was when you were coming at the end of that uh, um, your career as a professional player although you had uh, like a job lined up did it seem almost an unknown as to what you're going to do? If like, did you th- give any thoughts if that fell through the c- contingency plan? Because you got no mm. experience, like in real world. In, in, yeah, in yeah, yeah, cars. yeah. Yeah, you don't quite know how it's going to pan out. Like I say, I, that's why I feel I'm lucky. I've fallen into a, a job which I'm, I'm happy with and, and really enjoying. But yeah, if, if I hadn't worked out, I'd like to think like a thought I'd gone into some other sort of coaching job because that's the route I wanted to go down and. Like I say, you know, I sort of probably I'm happy with sort of financially. I sort of you know looked after the money I sort of earned to, to protect you know me and my family and look after them because I know I'm going to be finished in my you know mid thirties. And like I say, we talked well, you know, we've got plenty of our life left to live. So um, yeah, I did did sort of think about that, but at the end of the day, when you finish, you don't quite know exactly how it's going to pan out, and and that's that's the reason for for working towards it. What whilst you're still playing, so you know to try and make the best of it when you do actually finish. Mm. Mm. What's um? What you is there anything you finding challenging at the minute? <clears throat> Unexpectedly. Um. It's a good question. Uh, you're too I, stable. I, you're too <laughs> stable, mate. No, I'm, need I'm, some I, instability. <laughs> it is tough. I suppose that 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 banter and stuff with the boys is is tough. Like you know and. When you go in, and but that's that's not a big big issue, you know what I mean? Because I I'm quite happy with you know obviously the, the life I got with my family and stuff, so that keeps me busy, and I've got that sort of balance if if you like, which which I'm happy with. But um, yeah, what am I struggling with? I don't know. It's, uh, I think now I've found that routine. I think initially when I first finished, it's it's just trying to find that balance. My my job at the moment is split up into sort of three parts essentially. Because I'm working with the Swans University, I'm working with the Ospreys Academy as a skills skills coach and then I'm doing the kicking stuff with, with the senior squad. So, you know, I'm sort of arranging my own sort of diary around the kicking. The university and the, the academy stuff is sort of set in stone. So I'm just trying to work around that really. So like, like I say, I, I'm just glad I've got some sort of routine and structure because I think if I didn't have that, then perhaps it might be a little bit more unsettling. Then. So tell me how the book fits into that. Then. <clears throat> you must have some, some anxiety around the book. <laughs> well, that's out next week now. So... 
about uh, supposed to be out June the fourth, but obviously because of the lockdown, it uh, was put back. So uh, how did it come about? So when I played in Gloucester, my eldest boy Harrison, he, he wanted a, a kids rugby book. So as you do, you just think you know. It, well, there was a book fell off school, so I thought I'd pick one up. There wasn't one there, so I thought I'd just go online, you know, and, and grab one, no problem. But it, there wasn't any there. There was <coughs> a lot of fact books and you know rugby World Cup books and things like that, but didn't really interest him. So. It, that's what got me thinking initially about the idea. Um, so, like, a, you were you were looking for, you know, like you got the football, which is like Roy of the Rovers, that yeah, kind of stuff. yeah, and like, like Frank Lampard's Roy football books, things like that. Um, and there, there wasn't anything like that to, to do with rugby. So, that was when, when like I say, when I was in Gloucester. So, I thought to myself, you know, there's definitely a gap in the market for for rugby books for kids, but didn't do anything about it for about a year. And then um, I got back to the Ospreys, and there's a, a family friend who. Matt Malpope, who uh, he, oh, I know that. Name. Yeah, he's a, he's a radio DJ and you know he's a musician and all that. And like I say, he lives in Mumbles, family friend. So I just rang him up on, on one of our days off, and I just said, "Oh, Mal, you know, I got this idea. You know, I don't know what you think about it, but can you put me in touch with a children's author? Like, and I can have a chat to him and see what he thinks about it." And anyway, he got me in touch straight away. We met up uh, within a couple of days, and Dave Braley, who I'm co-authoring the book with. I told him about, I sort of wrote a lot of ideas down and what I, I wanted it to come across like. And he was like, brilliant, great. So we got right in instantly. Um, and the, the book itself to write didn't take sort of too long. You know, we met up sort of a couple of times a week for, for a few hours and got it done. But that that was almost the, the easier part. He was trying to get the book published then uh, and try and find a publisher to, to back it. So that was a bit of <clears throat> a bit of a wait, probably, I don't know, five, six months probably where we had a couple of sort of nibbles but nobody really came back and then, then Polaris, a Scottish publisher called uh, Pete Burns who uh, loves his rugby, he got in touch and said, you know, I love the idea, this is great and you know, we're going to meet up. So he came down from Scotland, met us in Cardiff and pretty much after that, we, we had to get a literacy agent as well, sorry, who sort of set up the meeting and the things and after that meeting it was like, yeah, we had a two book two book contract and it was like flipping heck this, this is brilliant so it'd been sort of the high of sort of getting the book finishing thinking this is great to then oh, it's no good if no one picks it up like you know so once once he sort of agreed and we signed the contract it's was, it was brilliant have you written a book before? no what was that like? Mate, when, yeah, was, <laughs> when was the last time you wrote a story? <clears throat> yeah school? well since yeah English in school but like I say so Dave, Dave is, is the he is the children's author and it's basically sort of my, my ideas and we say to each other, you know, he, he couldn't do it without me and I couldn't do it without him, as simple as that. And uh, it works so well. He's, you know, another good guy who we get on really well with. Well with. So, you know, it was tough at the start where <clears throat> he'd have some ideas and I'd be like, you know, well, perhaps it's not what I want, you know. So I had to go back to him and say, you know, can we change this, can we change that? And he'd come to me and say the same thing. And so with a collaboration, you know, we, you've got to be on the same page and, Luckily enough, we we were, and yeah, like I say, we've got two books. So, are you chucking your own like childhood stories in there? Yeah, so it's it's a fictional book. Uh, a guy called a boy called Jimmy Joseph, um, and he a lot of him is is based around me. So, is it you know, there's a couple of fictional stories and stuff to sort of add to the story. But for example, you know, he, he wears glasses. I was a I, I short sighted, wore glasses since the age of nine. I wear contact lenses now. Asthmatic, uh, love salad cream on toast, all the things I I did when I was younger, and it's, it's a relationship. My grandparents, you know, really close to my grandparents, and that relationship with Jimmy in the book, you know, is reflected in the book. So there's a, there's a lot of similarities uh, in the book compared to me. <laughs> <laughs> salad cream on toast. Sorry, have you tried it here? Or not? No, I haven't. <laughs> we, we put I, some in a toaster now after, right? <laughs> I tell you what, I tried the other day. Was it? <clears throat> it was. Uh, it was. Uh, Simon's recommendation was uh, two things. Oh yeah, peanut butter on marmite on toast. I've had marmite marmite on toast. Not, peanut butter on awesome. marmite, right? And no, it was all right to eat. It wasn't disgusting. It was nice. I like both those things, yeah. but it was like chewing cement. You know, it's like <laughs> oh god, I had jaw strain. Well, and if then, you try that, you could try sour cream on toast. Thing, you know, I, I I don't like sour cream. But the yeah, other one was uh, peanut butter <laughs> on bacon. <laughs> oh, I prefer the sound of that. It was nice. It was there. Yeah, it was nice. Yeah. Right I'll, give, I'll give that a go. Go right off topic, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How do you get that? <laughs> no, I did not wait. It was you, Salad Cream on Toast. It's Salad Cream on Cream on Toast as a kid. Flipping out. Your parents not like you. <laughs> Flipping out. Guys, all is left in the house, I think. <laughs> What's your earliest memory of rugby? Uh, 
<clears throat> playing with my brother's age group. So my brother's two years older than me, um, and he, he's a great rugby player as well. And just unfortunate, he you know had a lot of injuries throughout his career, so he had to cut short. At sort of 27 years old, I think he was 28. Um, but anyway, yeah, I started off for my local club, Abraham Quinns, and that's actually the the shirt that's on the front of the book, the the black and red hoops. Um, and yeah, pl- just playing and. I was I was five going on six at the time, so he was playing for the under eights. So I was way too young, and he'd never be able to do it now. But I'd be there, my kit drowning me on the side of the pitch, and it was like, uh, our coach Di Braga. Um, he'd always chuck me on for like the last minute of the game, and I'd hang about on the wing, and you know, every now and again I'd get the odd touch, and I'd get piled, piled into the ground by these big blokes. But I, that's that's my earliest memory. And actually, speaking with my grandparents, my first try was. I think I was six years old playing for my brother's team. I snuck in at the corner and uh, he was filmed. Uh, one of the parents filmed it and put it on the on the tape. And my grandfather, you know, and my grandparents so proud. They play it to everyone who come up the house. And uh, he left it in the, the tape recorder one day. I then taped the uh, corner street over it. So and he he was devastated. And every time he gets reminded about it now, he's uh, he's got rid of it. But uh, yeah, that's probably my earliest memory playing for Abraham Quins. Left for that Quins. What? Didn't Abraham have three different <clears> teams? <throat> Quinns, All Stars. Quinns, Green Stars. Green Stars. Green Stars yeah. and uh, the Abraham Juniors, yeah. So it was Abraham Wizards. That's right, yeah. yeah. I used to hate going there. I'm bloody freezing. I was bloody <laughs> freezing. Hailstones coming in horizontally. Uh, that was down Abraham Green Stars. That was Green down by the beach. Stars, yeah. Yeah. Jesus Christ. And uh, you must have paid for the school. You went to Glen Avon, didn't you? Glen Avon, yeah. yeah. So Central Juniors Primary and then Glen Avon Comprehensive. I drove down there the other day, actually, because they've got rid of that school now. And. Um, just it's built, built houses on there, so the, the street name is, is called Glen Avon, but there's no Glen Avon school there. When did you start at Neath? So I started playing in Neath when I was 18. So when I got my professional contract with the academy, I was, I was playing semi professional for Neath as well. Was it, did, in terms of an enjoyment <coughs> factor of, of, of playing rugby like that professionally or semi professionally then, was it more enjoyable then than compared to now? I take the, like, the money mm. aspect aside. Yeah, yeah but just on an emotional level? I don't know, I got asked that question the other day, and I think, there, like, you you play, you play you play for the love of game anyway, but when you become professional, and, you know, it, it is more of a job, even though you enjoy it, and it doesn't really feel like a job, that, that pressure comes with you then, when, when it is your job, and you're getting paid, and you've got people criticising you, and you've got that, when it, when it was with Neath, there was none of that, you know, and obviously there's people watching, and, you know, they'd have their say in the stands, but, you, you know, you didn't know anything about that, like, you know, I was just out there, Loving my rugby, and um, I'd come from British Steel, so I played a season or season and a half in the Steel Company uh, at senior rugby, and then got picked up with Neath. And oh, I, I just love in every game, and, and and to be honest, I had a bit of luck as well to get to get a run. I think you know you, you've got to be dedicated to your sport and you know to make it to the top. But I think you need a bit of luck along the way. And I remember I was on the bench. Um, it was a, a scrum five sort of the scrum five cameras were there, and I was like I was bouncing, and I was thinking, oh, I hope I get on. Sean Connor was the ten. Who'd, he's, he's playing for the Ospreys, but he wasn't needed for the Ospreys, so he came <coughs> came down and played for Neath. So I was on the bench and just hoping to get five minutes, and then he got injured after about 10, 15 minutes, and I came on, and I think I kicked kicked all my goals and kicked a, a two drop goals, I think, and all of a sudden he's out injured. I, I'm playing the rest of the season then, and you know I have, I have a good season, and then the following season for Neath, um, I go on a Welsh tour to Argentina. So, you know, if, if Sean Connor hadn't got injured, I'd only had five minutes and hadn't made an impact, you know. It's it's interesting that how it, it could go, like, you know, and I know it's something, you know, the cream always does rise to the top, but, you know, sometimes it perhaps doesn't get there. Mm. It's interesting you mentioned just now about the, like, the, the flipping abuse side of things and and also, I mean, you said about people, you, you, you play for love of the game. Do you think that is maybe less, the, well, less the case mm. now where... See, one of the things I see with fo- football, just mm. to, I don't want to compare the two because they're, they're completely different. And I, I love rugby and yeah. I don't love football. <laughs> I enjoy watching it, but I, everything else about it, I don't yeah. like yeah. from the, the way like, a lot of fans are and just the hooliganism and even the way they conduct themselves on the sidelines, the parents yeah. and that, from a grassroots level. But I'd never been involved with football until my daughter started playing. And all of a sudden I found myself involved yeah. and then I was doing the touchline. You were, the, not, you were the hooligan, then? Huh? <laughs> no, I, I, I know the hooligans have a go at me because I was on touchline. Didn't know the offside rule, nothing. Like it was a joke. But it's it. 
what I noticed in football, so get this, right? And this is England, because yeah. my, my kids live in England. I live in England. And what I noticed in football is at the grassroots level, is the inter- we know how much of a, of a factor money is in football. It's a factor in rugby, right, as well. But this is how much of a factor is in football. That at a grassroots level, mm. when my youngest started playing, when she was seven or eight years old, she started playing football, right? And money was a factor there, mm. seven or eight years old. If she wanted to, for example, change clubs mm. mid-season, there'd be a transfer fee. At that age? Seven, eight years old, there'd be a transfer fee because they'd have to pay the league to transfer clubs at that age, right? And so when you're mm. introducing money at that age, how can you... Exp- like, it, first off, it takes away that playing for the love of the game. Yeah. Money is involved straight away. And I think as, it, as it, that, that's where the problems start with the football. Yeah. So when it comes to the rugby, and now with the introduction of you know all the money, and it's brilliant that you guys get paid what you get paid, but... I think it does take away, maybe, and potentially in the future, that <clears throat> the respect for the game, the reason why you do it. I'm playing with your mates as well, I suppose. So, like, you know, if at seven years old, like, I, I look back the teams I was playing when I was seven years old or, or 12, 13 years old. I remember, obviously, the clubs I played for, but the, the boys I was playing with at that time. So, if you're jumping around clubs at, at that age, especially, you know, how you can get any consistency and build up any tidy friendships as well. Mm hmm. Mm-hmm. So, uh, well, there we go. I mean, uh, how much was that a factor? So, how much was that a factor when when you were switching between clubs? How much a factor did that play? The sort of community side of it, the friendship side of it, the peer group, you know? Yeah, like obviously, I, I moved from from the Ospreys to Gloucester, and then to France. Um, and to be honest, with you, the when I moved from the Ospreys to to Perpignan, it was a uh, obviously I, I'm chuffed I did it, and it, it was more than a money move in the end, but. Initially, it was it was because I was offered good money, and in rugby, as you know, it's, it's nowhere near as much as football. And we spoke about you know you got a life after it, and you know you want to try and look after your family. So it was that was a big factor in it. And you know that when I got there, then I realised what a, what a great place it was, what a great club it is. And um, you know at the time, you know you probably you see the contract, and you're like, well, but like yeah, you know you, you don't think about too much else. But I, I obviously knew Perpignan was a top club. Um, and, and great supporters because I played there the year before for the Ospreys and they came to us and, and, and played against us so um, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled I did it and experience a different country because I suppose if I wasn't playing rugby you know, I wouldn't have experienced so I would never have gone to live in, in a place like I in France for, for three years or, or even Gloucester mm. Going back to the social media side mm. how, do you deal, how do you deal with the stings so the shit you get when you move clubs the 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 abuse you get when you make a mistake <clears throat> on the pitch. How how do you deal with that stuff? To be, I didn't I didn't go on Twitter until quite late on. <laughs> Interestingly, brought Twitter up straight away. Yeah, well, no, that's that's the social media side, isn't it? That is the the fan it side of it, isn't it? It's also a super negative one. Well, it is. It oh is. my god! And it's it's a great tool for for the players and and the fans to interact who, who use it properly. Exactly. Yeah. But then it's it's a it's it's a tool for people who just want to have. A, I want to have a go at you, and I did experience it. You know, probably towards the end of my international career, I can't remember exactly when I got onto Twitter, but it was, it was later than a lot of the players. And then I sort of gave in to the temptation and, and got on it. And yeah, after, sometimes after Welsh games, if I knew, you know, I didn't have the, the best game, I, I wouldn't even bother looking. I'd know, and you just turn it on, and it'd be just you just flick down. You think don't even start looking at that because <laughs> it'll drive you into the ground, like you know. But I think. Yeah, it, it is tough, and I, and I see it now. Obviously, you now I've finished, and people on on social media just just calling players out, and yeah, I don't like that. And obviously, what you've got the sort of the mental health factor now as well, and it, it's it's amazing how much it affects, you know, people's minds. Like you know, even though they might not show it, and uh, I heard a good quote the other day from from somebody that uh, um, no no snowflake feels responsible for for the avalanche. So you know, that one comment can can make all all the difference and you know they don't really realize it you know 10 seconds just a quick throwaway comment can can make a difference to someone and yeah i've never been a, a fan of all that sort of nonsense really you know if you've got nothing nice to say don't say anything at all i i think that's a great that's a great quote was it no snowflake feels the effect of the avalanche feels responsible, feels for, the responsible avalanche. for the avalanche yeah. who said that Are you, i think it was uh, you know matt johnson the tv presenter the Welsh TV presenter. Oh right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he was on. He was on a podcast a, a couple of weeks ago, and I heard him say it, and uh, I thought, yeah, it's just, that's, that's pretty true, to be honest. Yeah, it's a challenge, isn't it? Because with the social media, for anything these days, sports, flipping business, anything, you, 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 you have. 
realistically you have to have a presence you've got to have a presence there and then and then the other challenge to it is so one of the things i tell myself not that i get much hate like i don't hardly get anything unless i bring it on myself by saying something ridiculous is don't look at the negative stuff yeah like because there are some places that people they just they just post negative stuff because why not yeah it's ridiculous yeah um i go yeah don't read that but one of the one of the challenges is if you're going to be on social media, mm. you need to be engaging with the people who are engaging with you, yeah. which means you've got to read through stuff. Yeah, and sometimes that stuff that stinks. Do you yeah. get um, Do you get any? Uh, have you ever had any coaching when you were playing to to do with dealing with social media, dealing with that psychological aspect? Well, funny, we speak about Tim. So Tim was in in the police force, so he does uh, presentations about not just social media, but about the boys going out out there on a night out and getting in trouble and just avoiding confrontation and stuff, obviously from his police background and stuff. So he's he's done presentations on, on that for the boys and probably, well, it's been brought in since he's come in the last two or three years, which I think most of the boys are aware of, but, you know, the boys, especially maybe sometimes the younger boys, they'll go out, have a few drinks and, you know, perhaps they, they won't be thinking as they probably normally would be and, and tweet something and all of a sudden the paper can pick it up and so you, they've got to be careful with that and, and Tim is, is a guy to sort of keep them keep them in line with things like that but and just realise that, you know, one one comment or one tweet can, can you know, make all hell break loose, like, you know. Mm. Yeah, so are you gonna, have you got, are you going to set up social media accounts for the book? Not for the book, no. No, we're not going you know, to, so obviously it'll just go through my, my social media and, and Dave, who I'm doing the book with, and the publisher and stuff. So, yeah, we actually we actually got a YouTube channel with uh, some some rugby skills videos and stuff, which I'm doing. So that that'll be sort of part of the the book. It's called Chasing a Rugby Dream. So that's with the the YouTube channel we'll be using. Huh. Oh, yeah. I, oh, so, so what's it going to be on the channel again? Sorry. Uh, it's the channel's called Chasing a Rugby Dream. Or the book is called Chasing a Rugby Dream. Yeah. So there'll be a YouTube channel because there's there's books a uh, part part of the book. Um, Jimmy's you know, performing different skills and things so I want to try and replicate those fr- from myself into a YouTube channel so the kids can read the book and then flit across the YouTube channel if you want to pick up on some of the tips that, that Jimmy's been performing in the book and you're going to act them out on, on yeah I've done I've done uh, ah. four or five now already for the release next week um, and I just keep building on that as the books go on then you know you mean rugby skills tips yeah ah brilliant yeah, yeah. have you recorded any yet yeah, yeah, I've recorded uh, about four, four, or five videos. Well, like, well, give me examples of them. Oh, just, just your, your passing tips, your kicking tips. Um, what other ones I've done? Sidestepping. Uh, just, yeah, your, your general rugby tips for for the young ones to look at. Hey, I'm going to be subscribing. <laughs> I'm going to be <laughs> subscribing. Back garden, no. I retired in. Uh, I say retired. I retired from my uh, non-professional rugby in 2009, and then I've just because of the forces barbarians, I've got back into it. And uh, yeah, everything. One thing I've discovered is everything's fine. I'm fit as a fiddle. Apart, well, you can't get you. You can. It's like it must be you in your off season. Nothing prepares your body for the impact. Just hitting people with your body. Just, yeah. just I couldn't walk for about a week after. Same as you, Simon. Couldn't walk <laughs> for about a week after that first rugby for heroes match. But then the other thing is handling, mate. Oh my god. <laughs> oh, I hadn't touched the rugby ball in like five years. Literally, I hadn't touched yeah. the ball in five years, six years. It's like picking a pen up when you first go back to school after six weeks holiday, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. I went training. Yeah, I went training. Yeah, yeah, your hands in. <laughs> yeah, you don't know where you are, do you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your hands in on the biro. You have, to, you have to stop every two seconds, flipping it. Yeah, I went training with, uh, I went training with old, Le- old Lemontonians a couple of weeks back. Again, that's my. F- Bear in mind, I played two matches last year for Rugby for Heroes. But uh, I, the, my first training session was about two weeks ago. And train with people who, who still play all the time. They're like thirty-five years plus. Yeah, they still yeah, play yeah. all the time, yeah. mate. Could I get one pass? I, I was just passport out looking. <laughs> man, they flipping hated me. They hated it's, me. <laughs> it's mad how quick you lose it, mind, isn't it? You know, it's just you take for granted and you training every day. But uh, yeah, like I am trained out with a rugby ball properly for well since, since before the lockdown. So it's that March, is it? March, April. Mm. So yeah. Do you want to keep it up even though you're not playing? I'll keep my my fitness up and stuff, not, not to the extent that. I was when I was when I was playing, but I do uh, sort of two, three, five k runs a week around the cliffs in in Mumbles where I live, and I got it before the lockdown because uh, I was hoping to have a few games to finish the season. But obviously, that didn't happen. I set up just a, a bench and some dumbbells and like a, like a prowler out the back garden. So I just kept that up now. So I go, I don't, I don't go to, to any gyms. I just do do a bit out the back, do go for a run, do some weights, so sort of three three times a week and. I'm happy with that, I'm comfortable with that, so you keep ticking over, but yeah, I, I don't want to sort of 
trained to the extent I, I was when I was playing because I felt, well, maybe in, in, in the future, in the next four or five years' time, perhaps maybe think about different. But at the moment, cause I've just finished. I'm, I'm happy just uh, sort of taking over. Yeah. You know, when you, were, when you were training and preparing, especially your most recent stint with like the Ospreys before you retired, do they pay any attention to, not only pay any attention, but do they do any level of re- reduction of like impact uh, impact activities in the training sessions, either in the beat up to the season mm. or in between the games? Do they sort of have a policy where they switch off the impact stuff, like attack a big hits, tackling, stuff like that, or do they keep it all in like normal? Because when I was, uh, granted, I never played professional rugby, yeah. but it was, you know, you, you trained like you were going to play. But then as time goes on, especially in other sports, mm. there seems to be attention being paid to in between, right, this, this, this calm down on the impact and yeah. stuff. So even more so, probably the last two or three years I've noticed, like usually, you, when, when I first started, your Tuesday would be your big contact day. You do 40, 45 minutes flat out contact. Um, but towards the end, it, it's actually changed again a little bit now with the Ospreys. You know, they do it probably a little bit more contact than I did towards the last couple of years of my career. But because, you know, the game is so physical, I think as long as you're physically fit and you're mentally ready and technically, you know, you, you, you do hits with a, with a bag and, you know, if, if you are doing sort of 15 v 15, you know, you get shoulders on and, you know, you'd have the odd sort of five, ten minutes worth of flat out contact. But I think, you know, the, the game... The match on the weekend is so physical itself. I think, you know, if you kept doing that throughout the week and during the game, you know, the boys' bodies just break down. You know, you, you see the amount of injuries now from from a game just on the weekend. So, with that impact during the week as well, it, it'll soon take its toll. So, I, you know, there's only so much you can do. Yeah. How much of a concern is it amongst players with the head injuries aspect? Obviously, the head injuries have always been there. Head clashes mm. have always always been there, right? But obviously, um, sci- medical science is advancing. There seems to be more <clears> um, <throat> attention being paid to it. How much of a concern is it for players at the moment? Are you oh, concerned? Yeah, it's just, well, I, when I was playing, I, I wasn't too concerned about it. Maybe I had a couple of head knocks and got knocked out a couple of times and had a bit of concussion and you know, I had one, one bad sort of, for me, you know, a bad head injury in, in South Africa. Um, on a summer tour, I went to tackle sort of Andrew Bishop, who, you know, he's not a great a great idea anyway. But uh, especially when I try and tackle him with my temple into his hip, it he uh, sort of knocked me out, and and I had memory loss for for a few hours, and and that was quite scary. But you know, you see some of the concussions, you know, sort of George North, Lee Halfpenny, they they are picking up, and you know, I suppose it's concerning when you get you know four, five, six different concussions and. You know, you're out of the game for for months. You know that that's when it does get a bit of a worry. And going back again, what we're saying, you know, you you finish mid thirties and you've got the rest of your life to live with your family. So that that is a worry, and you know, hence the reason why you know the the world rugby are trying to you know cut down the contacts to the to the neck and the head to to try and protect players. Mm. I had a on on episode ninety nine. I had yeah. a lady on uh, called Mandy Bostwick, yeah. and uh, well, did Sean mention this? Did she? No, oh, yeah. oh, sorry, I think you're grinning there. I think what he said. Uh, right, so Mandy Bostwick came on my radar within the last sort of year, year and a half, and um, obviously there's there's a uh, like any like like anyone there's there, there's mental ill health among some ex-military guys or military guys yeah. and girls, okay. Yeah. And one of those things is like PTSD, for example, or um, or other mental ill health. And one of the things that uh, Mandy Bosby is campaigning for. Uh, she, sorry, she is a specialist, uh, specialist trauma psychotherapist. Okay, yeah. and one of the things that Mandy is campaigning for, which the Americans are ahead of us on now anyway, um, is for military people to be screened for traumatic brain injuries mm. um, when they join a certain periods in their in their service and then after an incident particularly blast incidents not just impact to be uh screened for a traumatic brain injury yeah. and one of the one of the reasons this come, has come about is uh, so i remember first hearing about tbis from my dad actually god six or seven years ago and um and it was about american football in america funny enough yeah <laughs> and there was they'd done a study and of people uh players who had been 
who had died. You can only, you could, at the time, you could only test for CTE, which is um, damage to the brain, TBI. You can only test for it after people had died, right? And they were testing, they'd been asked to test certain people to see if they were suffering from CTE due to repeated knocks on yeah, the head. Yeah. And the reason was they reckoned that this was causing erratic behavior out of, out of, out of uh, character behavior and like, like criminal stuff, like alcohol, um, drug abuse, stuff like that, right? Um, and they found that on this study, 90, sorry, 90 or 95% of the people that they did these tests on, they had, mm. they had this damage to the brain. Now, that doesn't mean 90, 95% of American football players have it because no. these people are all at rapid behavior. They're probably going to have it anyway. But anyway, through um, following on from that, what's been discovered is that at the moment, um, so that erratic behavior, mental health, depression, for example, mm. anxiety, for example, all like common things you experience when like, you're on about what you're saying about going from, I'm doing this, and this is my life, and then mm. all of a sudden, an abrupt change, injury, mm. or whatever, and you have, to, you have to change out your routine, and you go down the pan sometimes. Yeah. And what uh, what Mandy's come, what Mandy is saying, and the science is saying, is that this isn't just like a, a psychiatric issue. It's not just a lot of the time. It's not just the case of going in front of your therapist and talk about what's going on. A lot of the time, most of the time, is actually a physiological change in your brain. Mm. So what happens when you get a head a head impact or like a blast trauma, or you get a head impact, um, is it the brain goes into a like a, a fight or a, a fight or flight mode. It, it's like it goes into survival mode, yeah. and so it shuts down. A, it ch- changes its brain chemistry and causes a change in your brain, which upsets the sort of the the, the new, neurology side of things. The, what's the uh, not neurology uh, the, uh, imbalances the hormones in your brain. Yeah. So what she's campaigning for is screening various stages of military service to see what your baseline sort of brain state is when you join. Yeah. And then if you have an injury. <clears throat> blast or head impact how it affects what is it after and they can compare that to what it was and go right they need to increase this hormone and bring it back into balance and then address the psychiatry side of things yeah which i think what is what they start to do yeah is which i think is what they're starting to do in america with american football as well american military are already doing it but they're not doing it over here yet and there is this is one of the reasons why i think the head injury concerns come about because a lot of the times the symptoms don't manifest themselves for like four or five years until like four or five mm. years later you know. It's like that film Concussion, is it? Have you seen that Concussion? I've heard of it, I've not seen it. Yeah, because that's obviously about the American football and the brain injury side of things. And when they they uh, finish playing American football, they have all the, the anxiety, depression, and they're wondering whether it's from, from the head knocks. But I'm not sure whether American football won't want to sort of entertain it because obviously it's, it's a multi billion pound sport, isn't it? and they, they don't want anything like that sort of, sort of jeopardising their sport, I suppose. Well, yeah, this is part of the issue with. Well, to caveat that, mate, so one of the things that uh, that they've discovered out of when you identify a TBI, if you identify it and treat it within the first six months, you can bring it almost back, you can almost cure it completely. Yeah. Now, one of the problems with the military is, you know, you let's say you, you, part, you get blown up in, I don't know, flipping Afghanistan or Iraq or wherever, yeah. or, or some accident in training in the UK. Well, on a tour, say, it's a six-month tour. Mm. You like you don't get screened for TBIs in a minute, so there's no hope of getting of getting um, screened for it at any point and getting treated within like a month or flipping yeah, what, yeah. What, whatever whatever length of time it is. Um, which is the point it's making. It's like when by the time they discover it, which is the worry I think with sports, especially contact sports, American football, rugby, stuff like that, boxing, MMA, is that they're not realizing it's there until it's too late. Yeah, it's really yeah. difficult to bring it back to baseline. Like that's just it's interesting and scary at the same time, isn't it? But the point there is, if you can if you can screen for it, it doesn't impact the sport. Yeah. See. Yeah. So okay, Lee Halfpenny or James Hook or you know George North or any one of you guys, head impact off. What do they do at the minute? Concussion. It's yeah. like twenty eight days off. Yeah. You know, hang on. Let's screen for a TB. I don't know if they do it, but let's let's yeah, they they do that. Screen yeah. for a TBI yeah. and then just start the treatment because a lot of time with the with it, it's it's the neuroendocrinology changes mm. what it is, which is the hormones in the brain. It's simply a treatment of to rebalance the hormones, yeah. literally treat you with hormones, and then to bring that back to baseline. Okay, you're good to go again. Now yeah. let's check your psychiatry side of things. So, like you say, they'd all have to have a scan at the start, wouldn't they, just to see what their brain is like? Ideally, to start with, yeah. ideally. So, the problem at the moment with the military aspect, well, it's going to be with all of it, the rugby mm. side and all that, is there isn't like you haven't got a baseline, but what they do have 
definitely in America, um, and they're trying to get it in the UK. Is they get they've got um, basically a database of people's uh, uh, general public who've had these scans because mm. they just the fucking they, they call them Meg scan, right? But people have them as part of other stuff. Yeah, they got a general baseline of what the normal person should be generally on your your endocr- endocrinology levels. Yeah. So for someone who has had a baseline scan at like yourself, you do a scan and they compare you to that national average kind of... They got, uh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, 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 you've got... You know, this lunatic hook has got <laughs> shared loads of testosterone. <laughs> That's definitely what we'll be coming up with. It is. It's interesting because it's new science, but the research is all there, but it's one of those, you sort of hope it's not going to take years to come into place because mm. it's, you know, it's, it's, like I said, it doesn't affect the military. It affects everyone. Yeah, of course it People does, in yeah. car crashes, people who flipping fall over on the street and, and bump their head off the pavement, you know, and don't get it looked at mm. or don't get it solved. You, you're talking four, five years, six, eight lines, sometimes long, less, sometimes longer. They go into depression, they're anxious, they just go down the pan, they chop themselves or they flip, end up on the streets or whatever. Yeah. And it seemingly, you don't know. Yeah, you don't know that's, why. That's true. It's interesting you talk about concussion. Have you seen Shane's documentary he did on concussion? Have you seen that? It, uh, he goes out and he meets, he does a Skype call actually, I think that's American surgeon, I think it is. Um, or a doctor or something, and he, you know, he asked, he's speaking to Shane, and he said about his advice on on kids and just r- people playing rugby in general. And he was like, "Don't do it, don't do it. You'd be, you'd be still he's really extreme, like you know, and uh, probably a bit too extreme." But he was dead against it because you know he thought that the head knocks would have that much of an impact on him that it, it wasn't worth it, like you know. Yeah, it's it's, it's a con- yeah. it's a concern of mine. I genuinely, as I'm lucky, I've got girls, you know, mm. not kind of into that thing. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, it is a concern. And you, the, the challenge of these things is, right? This is two thousand. This is not going to say two thousand and twenty. Then I said it the other day. This is twenty twenty. How long have we been on the planet for? You know, we sort of managed all the way now. It's yeah. not. It doesn't seem like it's a major drama. Like, why are we paying attention? It's always been done that way. I started playing rugby when I was <laughs> seven years old. I was doing American football. I was flipping this out the other. It, it seems to be hard to identify what the issue was in the first place, especially mm. when you talk about issues like. Depression, anxiety, yeah. all that kind of stuff, which it, it seems unrelated, and it seems to be a psychiatry aspect, and it seems to be this world where it's difficult to understand how to fix it. But mm. now, like with what Mandy Bostwick is is saying, and these other like it's, it's scientists around the world are saying it, is that no, it's not just that fluffy psychiatry thing. No, there are there's like physical things in the body, physiological things in the body we can look at and we can help fix this stuff. Oh, it'd be silly to turn your nose up a lot and sort of just, you know, not, not entertain it, wouldn't it? You, you've got to look into stuff like that and especially with, like you mentioned, depression and all that sort of thing. It's, it's highlighted a lot more now, isn't it? And if, if that is a, a major issue or a major connection with the two, then, you know, what a breakthrough that'd be. It is. A, I, think part of the, I, think part of the, I think part of the resistance to it is, one of the res- bits of resistance, resistance to it is, is you think of the lawsuits. Mm. Yeah, well, that's that's another thing in that film concussion with Will Smith. You know, the, the lawsuits that could come in place if if something like that was to do with with American football. How come Will Smith ended up doing that? That's a good question. I don't know. I'll have a look at it. Have a look at it and let me know what you think. Yeah, I'll have to watch that. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, <laughs> first, two, first, two, so you got two book, two book deal. Yeah. Are you are you already are they already written? Oh, the first one is obviously first one's done. It's out next week, and the second one is pretty much it's finished, but it's just going to edit now because, like I said, the first one was supposed to be out June the fourth. Um, so we we planned initially to get the second one out before Christmas, but obviously it's all been put back. The second one will be out now after Christmas. So yeah, and if 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 they go well, hopefully we'll get um, we'll you know do do some more books because that's what we want. We want. Ideally, get a series, and, and Jimmy, Jimmy Joseph, the the boy in the book. Uh, hopefully, what we want him to grow, you know, as, as the book goes on. So, did you know someone called Jimmy Joseph? No, no, no. I, I, I we like the name Jimmy because I, I'm James, and uh, and Ian Evans, a second row for the Ospreys in Wales. He used to call me Jimmy, and I don't know, it's, just, it's a decent name for a guy in a kid's book, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's not Evan Evans either. Or something like that. So it's like UK, it's UK friendly. It is, it is. <laughs> England, England friendly. Yeah, it's no, it's no Welsh, uh, slam by both wingers, all that sort of stuff in there. Yeah. Like, start wrapping up. Been a, been a, been a pleasure talking to you. Um, anything else 
we, you want to cover? Uh, we haven't. We covered a fair bit there, I think, Kumi. Did they? There we go, yeah. Do you think anything else? Or? I'm looking forward to reading the book, mate. I go on in a car for you, so oh, you, yeah. can, uh, you can have that along with, uh, with the jersey as well for you. Yeah, so. I appreciate it. Pleasure, yeah. no problem. I appreciate it. Mate, an absolute pleasure. Hey, nice one, Hugh. Oh, no, hang Thanks on. I know. How do people buy the book? So <laughs> you, can go, <laughs> you can go on Amazon and search for Chasing a Rugby Dream. And yeah, like it's next week, it'll be out in all the bookshops, Waterstones, all, all the local bookshops and things. So yeah, keep an eye out for it. we got a, uh, we got a Forces Barbarians jersey for you as well. Oh, top man. Thank you very much. No problem, mate. Been a pleasure. Good luck with everything. Hey, cheers, Hugh. Thanks very much.